So neoclassicism, very important, super critical. What's going on here? So this is an art movement that basically looks at the Rococo. What does it mean, Rococo? Rococo is what happened late in the Baroque in France. The reign of Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette, very famously. So these people, as part of their flamboyant and decadent way of living, they also influenced the Baroque to go in a very like ornamental, decadent style with like a lot of flowers and a lot of like nude women that were kind of like playful and erotic. And aesthetics kind of goes out the window and imagine what what it would look like if you just... kind of go fan service for the most, I guess, superficial people, right? Superficial people want fan service, give me sugar, a lot of sugar, a lot of flowers, a lot of... So that late Baroque in France kind of turned into something very decadent and very vain. So neoclassicism, this is an art movement that basically looks at everything I was saying, the Rococo, the aristocracy in, in general, and they're saying, what's up? We need to be free. We need to get rid of these people. So this is the, you could say the first art movement that is explicitly political. This is an art movement that is advocating for the ideas of the French Revolution and the Age of Enlightenment, right? The Age of Enlightenment has all these philosophical ideas, great writers like, you know, Montesquieu and Rousseau and Locke and Burke and all those, you know, Voltaire, all those, all those big, big philosophers who end up, you know, dr- being the driving force of the French Revolution and the overthrow of the aristocracy. Artists of the time are infatuated with these ideas. And They're also trying to grasp visual vocabulary that they could use in order to express these ideas, right? So they are standing in opposition to the aristocracy and to their late Baroque, Rococo, decadent, whimsical kind of style. And they're thinking, what are we going to do? We need, we need a style that kind of opposes that. And along comes back the classics. Now, the visual markers, stoic, rational, harmonious. Detailed, theatrical, idealized, smooth, right? Very Renaissance, very Greco-Roman, right? So the neoclassicism is kind of like the Renaissance, but again, right? The Renaissance is the rebirth of the classic. Neoclassicism, literally new classics. So around this time, there was a monumental discovery, Pompeii, and all this ancient classical artwork that Coming from Pompeii was like blowing everybody's minds, and it was kind of like brought back this infatuation with Greek and Roman aesthetics. But also, there's another return to Greek and Roman ideals in the writings of the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, because, as some of you may know, in ancient Greece, we had early structures of democracy, right? So in in Athens, we had people voting. We had parliaments. We had all these things. that these, these writers were starting to look back at and say, well, the, the Greeks kind of had it way better than what we have right now. We have a king. They get to decide what happens with everybody. You know, their children just get that power. That's not cool. We should go with democracy. We should go back to the classical model of distributing the power and, and governance across the populace, right? So this invention of democracy in the 18th century It's not really an invention. It's kind of like it's a neoclassical activity. You take what existed in ancient Greece and you put a spin on it so that it works in the modern age. So there is a whole period of looking back to ancient Greece and ancient Romans saying, okay, we're going to learn from them about their models of governance. And then also it goes hand in hand with representing the desire to go to that model of governance through the... utilization of their aesthetic practices. So we have a newfound love for Greek aesthetics and everything that has to do with that revival of, of Renaissance aesthetics, which relates very closely to ancient Greek aesthetics and um, infusion of politics into art. You're going to see that these, these paintings are mostly paintings that carry some kind of political or social message. They would paint scenes from history or scenes from mythology that... You know, that they could kind of stand back and say, oh, no, you know, I didn't. This is not political. This is not propaganda. This is this is a painting of something that happened in ancient Greece. But it just so happened, you know, that if you look 
at the meaning of the story, you'll totally understand how it's advocating for the French Revolution. So they have to be pretty careful because it wasn't it wasn't a safe practice to openly, you know, advocate for revolution, but they did political art in a very subtle and super interesting way. So we're talking about the rejection of the aristocracy, uh, trying to go for freedom and all the other enlightenment ideals by returning to inspirations from ancient Greece, both when it comes to governance and also when it comes to aesthetics. So let's look at some examples of that. Pardon the interruption. Hope you're enjoying this video. And if you are, please take a moment to like it and to subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss any of my upcoming cool stuff. And if you want to support my mission of making art education affordable and accessible, please consider joining my Patreon through the link in the description below. You'll have access to live lessons, all recorded workshops, Q&As, and much, much more. And you can sign up today for as little as $2. Thanks in advance for the support. Now back to the action. So Jacques-Louis David, he's the pillar. He's the pillar of this movement. And here you can see examples of exactly what I was describing. So we have here uh, stories from ancient Greece. So this is the death of Socrates, right? So Socrates was, uh, was put to death for corrupting the youth with dangerous ideas, right? What does that relate to? Dangerous ideas, right? Revolutionary ideas. And you can see Socrates here. He's not afraid to die. He's saying, whoop, up I go. I'm going to the heavens. I don't mind. I will die for my ideals. I will die for my philosophy. And, and, and I will never repent uh, because I will spread wisdom at all costs, right? That's very political when you understand when this was painted and what this is referring to. Here we have the Oath of the Horatii, which also is a story in, in, in ancient Greece. They knew that they were going to war, probably towards certain death, but they would fight for what matters because they gave their word and justice is on the line and war in the service of justice is justified and right and moral and ethical, right? So, 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 Jacques-Louis David could have painted these people as savages, but no, he paints them like heroes because to take up a, a sword and fight in the service of what's right is just, is meritorious, is encouraged, right? I gave Jacques-Louis David two slides because, again, he's the pillar of this movement, so he deserves it. Uh, here we have a very interesting situation. This is, this is a story from, from ancient Rome where Brutus is getting back the bodies of his sons, which he condemned to death. So he discovered that his sons betrayed him, betrayed justice. And instead of pardoning them, he put them to death because nothing is more important than justice, equal justice under the law. Not, it doesn't, it's not that the, the sons of somebody important like Brutus just get, get to get away with things, right? So what does it say about the aristocracy, right? Important people, their family members don't usually get put to death right? Because that's reserved for the lower classes. But Jacques-Louis David is pointing a spotlight at the fact that once noble leaders of the past, so he thinks, were not above the law. The law would get implemented even if it's their children on the line, right? And, uh, and so then all of these stories, they have these morals, and we're not going to get into all of them, but here we have Proudhon, and we have Jean-Auguste Dominique Eng. This is the coronation of Homer, right? Very important. Here we have a portrait of Raphael, you know, staring at a painting, the importance of art. Yeah, he was a big fan of, of Raphael. But uh, generally, I think this, uh, this, is, this sums up neoclassicism. Neoclassicism.